we now have Robbie between us in lunch and Robbie, it's over to Robbie from Tegro and Super Gaming. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Robbie. I'm standing between you and lunch. Okay. <laughs> uh, as Matt said, so I'll be as short as possible uh, to kind of talk a little bit about it. Uh, my name is Robbie. I'm the founder and CEO of Super Gaming. Uh, and my talk is titled The Web3 Journey as a Web2 Game Studio. This slide is supposed to share all my experience building games for these past 12 years and tell you how cool the games are. But the only reason that I'll share my background is to tell you a little bit about where I'm coming from and what are the lessons that we've learned that might actually save you a little bit of time when you're thinking of this Web3 journey. I've been making shooters for the past six years. Mass Gun is our biggest shooter. It's been downloaded 60 million times. Learned a lot from building it, but essentially took all of that experience in terms of building our most ambitious game next, which is Indus, which is a true blue battle royale set in an Indo-futuristic universe. Uh, should be playable later this year. We also do a, a a Among Us meets audio chat meets game modes kind of game, which we call an MMO for everyone. An MMO for the reason for the meaningful connections that it creates between our players. When I usually speak about Tegro, I usually speak about you know, how Sid and me met in Dubai. It was a chance meeting. I was on vacation. Uh, and we ended up founding Tegro together at the end of that meeting. But the real story, why I'm in Web3, is actually not Sid and him convincing me to come over to the other side, but it's actually my eight-year-old son. <clears throat> so with the quarantine ending, I had decided to buy better shoes for my eight-year-old son uh, from the $12 Crocs that he wears. Uh, so I asked him, like, do you really want better shoes? So he says, no, no, I only use these for 30 minutes in the day. I'm good. He comes back to me 30 minutes later and he says, by the way, I really like these Roblox Nike $65 shoes and I want you to get them for me. He had a solid explanation. He said, hey, I only wear those Crocs for 30 minutes in a day, but these Nikes, my character wears for eight hours in a day. That day, I knew I was going to do a Web3 company <coughs> because digital assets are much more valuable or are going to be much more valuable in the, in the future than physical assets. That's really what Tegro is, which is a game asset marketplace. That's the end of my story. And the next few slides will kind of talk a little bit about our journey of actually building Web3 games through an example specifically of taking one of our old Web2 games, redesigning it, and kind of building it as a crypto native game. It's called Ethernia, should launch in a couple of months. Uh, Prakash, I'm going to need your help on this one. <laughs> Uh, we ha as a Web2 game, we have lots of content. Uh, and no, they're not all NFTs, bro. <laughs> this journey now is based on taking my understanding of what games used to look like and what they've started to look like going ahead. Why Web3 games? If we start there, uh, fairly obvious, you know, the blockchain is the enabling technology which actually takes, makes decentralized ownership of these digital assets possible. This is a foundation because these digital assets are going to be very, very valuable. It also is great value for players. In the Web2 world, the game company owned the entire game. In the Web3 world, the game is actually owned by the community. <clears throat> Today, we have DAOs that actually work with the, with, the, with the game creator to kind of be incentivized to kind of promote the game. With this why now kind of firmly established, I want to quickly tell you that this is not just true about Web3. This was always the case even in Web2. There, it was, it was kind of a gray market where you sold your account, uh, whether it was World of Warcraft, Half-Life 2, or, uh, you know, Second life, uh, this was a gray market where you sold your account. There are examples of Web2 marketplaces, the best example being Steam. So if I was to sit down and define what a Web3 game looks like, I would say a couple of things inside of it that are mandatory. 
The source of truth for this game is the blockchain. It's developed in, with, in accordance with this open ecosystem principle. The game, client, the, the game is client agnostic, but more importantly, the game embraces real world economies. Let me try and ex explain this real world economy with an example. The best explanation given to me with this was, I'm a mobile game developer. Initially, when we were trying to implement a real physics inside of a mobile game, it was fairly janky. But today, inside any one of our games, we have real world physics working beautifully. It's almost a commodity. In our opinion, Web3 is bringing the real world economy inside of your game. And that's probably the best explanation that I got when trying to understand what we were trying to do. I'm going to add a few, one more line out there called an and and said, hey, a crypto native game has game logic and rules implemented via smart contracts. This is inherently hard to do, might not be scalable, and you'll, you might not be able to spend money or you know, have that money to kind of run a game like this. Though there are a few examples of games that have tried doing this. What is not a crypto native game? A traditional game with a crypto wallet integration, a DeFi app that is gamified or has a skin, an RNG app that allows you to win crypto tokens, uh, glorified Excel simulators. You know, this is not what we think of as a Web3 game. For us, a Web3 game, and this is still our definition, a Web3 game still needs to be a game, it still needs to be fun. Before we kind of embarked on this journey of becoming a Web3 studio, we first tried to figure out who we are, why are we doing this. Uh, we coined, we kind of looked at all the various terms and we said play and earn would be the definition of what we are trying to do, not play to earn, which seems very much like a job description. <clears throat> For us, play and earn is a Web3 game that allows players to enjoy their time in the virtual worlds and have the option of earning from it, be it as a sole endeavor, be it being part of a guild, or being part of the community. Play and earn, to summarize, still needs to be a game, the games that are meant to be fun to play. It also fits well into what's been our ethos as a game company, that we are committed to creating memorable experiences that people can play for years. So designing for a Web3 game, we actually had a few criteria, a few steps that we kind of thought about. First is thinking about our personas from a Web3 game, from a Web2 versus Web3 game. How do we think about game assets? How do we build this game economy? How do we think about valuing these in-game assets? And finally, we'll talk a little bit about what we, th what we think is our summary of everything, which is the generations of economy. From a personas, from a Web2 perspective, we only had one persona that we were designing for. That's the player. Sure, there are different kinds of players. Casual, hardcore, midcore, uh, whales. All of these are different kinds of players, but just one persona that you're designing for. In a Web3 game, you actually have a bunch of different categories of people. Primarily, we think of these as three. The player that you already know, who's playing your game uh, for fun and maybe earning from it. Investors. <coughs> who buy into the game, hold and liquidate in the future, traders who might be speculating for events inside of the game. When we think about game assets, the key question that we've been asking ourselves is, can game assets be priced in a real world scenario positively? Now, those are the Roblox Nikes that my kid used, which are vanity, utility items inside of a game called Crop Bites, but also thinking about a few things which might be a combination of both. That barbarian might look like an NFT, but it has real utility value and is consumable inside of a game called Clash of Clans. The key question that we had was to think about can we extract and transfer this economic value from a game and bring it inside of the real economy. In the Web2 world, these items have been, we've, we've run a Web2 game mostly with the store model where these items are arbitrarily priced by, by us as game developers. They have unlimited quantity. Any limit that you see inside of it is traditionally self-imposed uh, to kind of sell certain packages. In the Web3 world, here is what's very different. 
the item pricing is determined by traders and investors. People might still be buying goods for status, recognition, affiliation, but ultimately, what we've realized, it's not the physicality of the object that gives it value, but the utility that this object gave it. I'll use an example to explain this, and this is also a plug for all of you to attend this next talk, uh, which is actually by the founders of Corobytes. This is one of the oldest crypto games still running, made in India. They just celebrated their fourth anniversary, uh, and this is something that is built right here, uh, and we'll have a talk about it in the next room. So inside of Corobytes, what you'll see is that the pricing of items is based on demand and supply via an order book not arbitrary. Uh, and what we've also done with what we're doing inside of Tegro as a marketplace is to kind of continue the same vision. It looks a little more consumer friendly, but with the same level of detail that you would find in any kind of marketplace. Talking about the next step, which is how do you value these assets? Typically, asset value has been about NFTs. So I'll start there from a vanity perspective. Vanity, which is the Assets' aesthetic value is not very measurable. But there are two parts to it, both the physical beauty of that object, but also the psychological thrill of actually owning that asset. But there are a few more properties that make an asset valuable. First, is the game itself fun? Any game that's fun is played for a lot longer, hence it's, it, hence it's a lot more valuable. High utility, if that item is used frequently inside of a game, it has higher utility. Last. Time value, is this asset difficult to obtain? Any asset that takes time to obtain has greater value. What we did then was to kind of think a little bit about taking all of these, putting these into a formula to set the value of this asset. What we realized is that games, but also the game assets inside of them do have some measurable intrinsic value that can and, give it, that can and does give it real world value. Today, we are at a crossroad. All of us here are trying to figure out this Web3 road or Web3 journey. We're trying to embrace and implement all these new technologies that we've been hearing about. Uh, but what we kind of think about is the two key principles inside of it. We want to facilitate trade between players as seamlessly as possible, but without destroying that key intrinsic value that a game does, which is community and fun. For this, we decided to kind of think a little bit about building our game in what we learned from the Web3 world, which is a very collaborative way of doing things. Traditionally, game companies have not really collaborated in terms of doing anything, but here is where, as a company, we thought that we would adopt to the Web3 style by kind of open sourcing all of our economy templates of how we think about these generations of economy and as they evolve in a Web3 game. The next slide, is really a summary of what we think about all of our learnings of designing a Web3 game economy. The first generation, or Gen Zero, is really what we're seeing in all the games in the market today. These are NFT only. They're more like Web2 games. They have poor liquidity, lots of assets, and hence low trade frequency. NFTs are high volume, low frequency traded items. Where we recommend that you start and where we started was to kind of thinking about breaking up your economy into a combination of fungible and NFTs. So FTs and NFTs. Uh, and what you would do there is to kind of consume these FTs quite a bit to build liquidity, find greater distribution, value, and market cap. Once you've actually got that demand cycle working, you would get to the next stage, generation two, which we call our predictable supply stage. In this predictable supply stage, you have great liquidity, great demand, great supply. That is really where institutional money, or there is some confidence for institutional money to start coming in. That's really Gen 2. Gen 3, uh, and my co-founder used this example earlier, so I'll just use the same one. Uh, you might not be able to afford a farm right at the start, so you might choose to work in one. And we've seen the gig economy where people started this way, and we think the same is true for a Web3 game. What's different is that as a game developer, you want to think about this use case and design for it upfront versus an afterthought and trying to implement it only using guilds. Your game natively needs to design for a service economy as a progression of the game. Finally, your game assets are now owned by the community, and they should have a say, 
similar to a budgetary reform process in what you want to do as inside of that. Whether you want to nerf something, whether you want to buff something, your community should have a say inside of it. That's really what we call a Gen 4 game, which is an economy governance game. Today, there are almost no games that have reached here, but we are doing or we're kind of working on a game that's in the Gen 3 stage. Our work is not done yet. We've kind of finished with this first part in terms of talking about the design of the game itself, but there's a lot of work to be done. Working with the community to build your game, and, and Prakash kind of mentioned this earlier, is kind of very different inside of the Web3 universe. Uh, I've, been, I've been to a lot of places that, I'm, that I've not usually kind of gone to, including Twitter spaces, Reddit, <coughs> uh, on, on a lot of Telegram groups. Uh, he told you not to go to Telegram, but I've been on a lot of Telegram groups, apart from the Discord groups that I was already doing while as a Web2 games company. Uh, marketing, you know, FOMO, buzz are all keywords that you've heard. Uh, but getting that community of yours to build that virality is probably the key as a Web3 game developer. Finally, you have your initial game offering, which actually brings liquidity to your game assets. We're not there yet in terms of what we're trying to do, so these are kind of our next steps. So to think a little bit about, you know, how this journey for Web3 has evolved. I actually want to go to an OG quote from one of the true open economy games called EVE Online, whose CEO, Hilmar, actually had this quote running inside of it. And he said that, and I quote, gamers hope that the values created from online games can also be used in reality. The online gaming content should have practical values in the real world. The gaming industry should evolve to allow gamers to make retirement plans by using the money that they earn from games. I'll also end with the story. Uh, you know, one of the side effects of the quarantine has been that my son sits right next to me when I'm working, so he's almost perfected every pitch that I've ever given. And this is the exact quote that he keeps showing me when I keep telling him to stop Minecraft and, and start playing, and, st and start studying. So much so that when he heard this quote that I was going to use in this game, he, he decided that my pitch would be significantly better if I didn't use the $65 Roblox Nikes that he kind of got, but used the new $10,000 <coughs> Nike Crypto Kicks that just got announced. <laughs> Creating games for this generation of gamers is really what we're doing at Tegro, and we'd love for you to come join us as we build this future of games. Thank you. Thank you.